Okay, guys, we're going to get rolling here on our Ultimate Edge webinar. So welcome to the webinar today, guys. Thanks so much for joining us. My name is John Murphy. I'm with Bay Equity Home Loans. There's the legal stuff up front. Things change on loans. We want you to know that. And that's no exception with bridge loans. Today, we're going to talk about bridge loans, how they work, and when you may want to use one. This is going to be an overview for today because I'm going to include three different options here. And so we're going to have to cover kind of a a 30,000 view. We do have another webinar that's posted on our YouTube channel. And if you want to see that, that goes into depth on the first two options. And it discusses the guidelines a little deeper than I'm going to do today. We'll put that in the link um, below the video on the YouTube channel. And if you're part of the webinar here, then just reach out. Brittany will send a copy of it to you. But first, before we dig into bridge loans, I need to ask you a question. Why is money also called dough? And the answer is, of course, because we all need it. Ha <laughs> ha, a little mortgage humor there for you. Um, second question, when does strategy beat rate? And the answer to that is a little more serious, potentially when it makes or saves you a pile of dough. So sometimes our clients are really focused on rate when we first chat and then we get into a conversation with them. We understand their goals, their uh, their resources better. And uh, we come up with a strategy which can save them a lot more money the way we structure the loan than just focusing on rate. And it also gets you the house of your dreams. Sometimes strategy is way more important right if that happens. And when it solves a problem, I tell our mortgage officers and our processors that we are problem solvers. That's what we do for folks. We get them into a home and sometimes it's a little difficult and we need to be a little more creative, but we solve those kinds of problems. We solve them with all kinds of loans, which we pull out of our loan toolbox. As you can see, we have conventional and bank statement loans and DSCR and all kinds of loans there. And in particular today, the loan in our loan toolbox that we're going to pull out and talk about is a bridge loan. So the question is, what is a bridge loan? Well, in its simplicity, a bridge loan is a loan or possibly two separate loans, depending on how we structure it, which is on what's called the departing residence and also on the new home that you're going to be purchasing. It's also known in the industry as a cross collateralization loan. It's really the same thing. So the departing residence is our name for the home that you currently live in. And you may be wanting to purchase another home, which is a, a residence that you're going to purchase and you have a problem there. The problem is you own your current residence and you want to buy the new home, but the down payment that you have available for the purchase of the new home is tied up in the equity on your current home. And so what do you do, right? There are some options. You don't qualify for the mortgage on the new home if you have still have the mortgage on your current home. So you can't just buy the new one, although sometimes people can, and that is certainly one solution. Most of the time they can't. If you buy the new one and you still have the current one, we're going to include both mortgages into what's called your debt to income ratio. And if you don't qualify, then it doesn't work. Plus, of course, your down payment, as mentioned, is tied up in the current home that you own. And interestingly enough, this is a significant need. According to 2021 National Association of Realtors profile of home buyers and sellers, 56% of repeat buyers, they use the funds from their departing residents for their down payment. Now, the fact that they, did, they said that it's the departing residence tells me that these people did not first sell their home and then use the proceeds from the sale to purchase the new home, because if that were the case, they would not have had a departing residence. The departing residence is in play when they keep the ripped departing residence and want to purchase the new one. So you use some other option. It could have been a home equity line of credit. It could have been a bridge loan. And there are other options as well. So it's a big need, as you can see. So the solutions, um, maybe they qualify for both mortgages, but maybe they don't have the down payment. And if they did have, have the down payment and qualified for both mortgages, that is one option, of course. They could buy the new home and then sell their current residence later on. That way they would have to be able to purchase the new home, not contingent on the sale of their current home. They could make an offer on the new home that is contingent on the sale of their current home. So that's where this term contingency comes up with guys. If you make an offer on a property and you have to sell your property in order to buy the new home, then the offer on the new home is contingent on the sale of your current home. That can be a problem because the seller may not want to wait for you to get an offer and sell your current home. They don't know how quickly that's going to happen. 
And certainly if you have an offer and they do accept it, it's probably going to be at the higher purchase price because they're willing to accept higher purchase price offer um, because it's a contingent offer. But then you risk the fact of being bumped when somebody else comes in with a non-contingent offer and they have the cash and they can bump you because they make the same offer and typically con contingent offers have that possibility built into them. You could get a home equity line of credit, as I mentioned, on the current home and use that for the down payment. But then again, you have to qualify for all those mortgages, including now the home equity line of credit. Or you could use what's called the bridge loan. We just talked about what that is to purchase the new home and ha not have any contingency on the purchase. So let's just walk through an example of a bridge loan that might work here. Let's say these people own their current residence. It has a lot of equity. Their current home is worth $600,000 they owe $200,000 on their current loan. So they have quite a bit of equity there. They have a growing family. They want to purchase a bigger home for $850,000, but they don't have the adequate down payment. It's tied up in their home and they can't afford both mortgages. What would they do? Well, it's kind of a paradigm shift here from a lender's perspective. If they owned both homes, and we could use those as collateral from a lending perspective, then they would have a lot of um, value there. The total value would be the home worth 600,000 plus 850,000 on the one purchasing. That's $1.45 million of value. And currently they only owe $200,000. So there's a lot of equity between both homes available there. They need $850,000, so we do a calculation. We take the $200,000 plus $850,000, divide that by the total value of $1.45 million. And as you can see, they have a 72% loan to value. Now, bridge loan math, I call it mortgage math, is not rocket science math. It's a little simpler than that. The lender will typically lend up to 75% of the value of both properties minus the current mortgage. And as you can see, we're at 72%. So let's show you how that math works out again here. We have two properties, 850,000 for the one they're buying, 600,000 for the one they own. Together, they're worth $1,450,000. If we use 75% as our criteria, they can borrow up to $1,087,500 minus the $200,000 mortgage that they owe on the one property and they still have $887,000 available to use as they need. The purchase price is only $850,000. They're good to go. Literally speaking, you can actually use a bridge loan and get 100% of the value of the property that you're purchasing if there's enough equity between both homes, given that calculation there. That's simply how they work. So what happens is the buyer buys the new home with no contingency. That makes it a very strong offer. That's why buyers like the bridge loan because they don't have to have a contingent offer. They use the available funds from the bridge loan to purchase the new home. Bridge loan uses both properties as collateral. You're gonna see there's a couple of different ways we go about doing that. And then the borrower sells their departing residence. It pays off the bridge loan or pays it down with the proceeds from the sale of it. They end up with a permanent loan on the new home and yay, they're into their new home with their growing family. So if you have any questions, guys, put them in the chat box. I'm gonna pause every now and then and take a look at that and see if there's questions there. Brittany, if you see questions, please reach out and let me know so we can answer those as we go. We will have time at the end as well, just so you know. So now I'm gonna take a look, we're gonna switch gears. We're gonna look at the actual functioning of the bridge loan. There's a couple different varieties that people are mostly aware of. And at the end here, we're gonna show you a third option, which I think will, may open up some eyes for some people. So you can do a bridge loan with one loan. The one loan is up to 75%, as I mentioned, of the value of the departing residence. And we're gonna note that as the DR residence, departing residence and the new property. So that loan's in second position on the departing residence. It does not pay off the existing loan that is there. So what the borrower will do in this particular case, they're gonna pay, make payments on both the new loan um, and the bridge loan. The, new, the current mortgage, let me say it again, and the bridge loan. So they have two mortgage payments to make. And if they potentially borrow up to 100% of the purchase price, they could have potentially an $850,000 bridge loan that they're making payments on. You can see the rate there for that particular lender today is 7%. Um, they're gonna make payments during the entire time of the bridge term. 
Uh, that rate does drop once they have paid it down and uh, the, once the current residence has sold to 6.75%, so that helps out. And the term of the loan is 12 months. That means they have 12 months that they can hold on to their current residence while they're trying to sell it, but they'll be making payments on both loans during that period of time. So that's kind of significant for people. So potentially there's another option here, which looks at it in a different way. This is the bridge loan with two loans. So there's a loan that is on the primary residence, the, the departing residence, up to 75% of the value of that home. That pays off their current loan, so that loan is going to be in first position. Notice the rate on that particular loan, this is just the loan that's on the departing residence, is 9.25%, a fairly hefty rate. There's no payments due on the loan, so you don't have to include that into your monthly budget when you buy the new home. That interest at 9.25% accrues over time and it just sits there and you have again 12 months to sell your home and pay off that loan. When you pay off the loan, you're going to pay off the 75% loan or the total amount plus the interest that has accrued over that particular time period. So the loan is paid off when the house sells in this case. Then they get a second loan. So this is a completely different loan, but from the same lender. Both the lender only does this, this bridge loan if they do both loans, but the lender will lend up to 80% of the purchase price on the new mortgage. This is their permanent loan. Currently, the rate on that loan is 7.25%. You can see the APR there, and there is no prepayment penalty. So oftentimes what happens when people get that loan and they sell their current home and if rates are down, then they're going to refinance into another loan. But you can see the, the issue here is bridge loans are not inexpensive compared to other loans. Let's compare these side by side just so you can see the difference between the two. So the one loan you can do an owner occupied purchase and you can do new construction. That lender is a different lender than the lender that does the two loans. They have a second home and non-owner occupied case by case. That means they won't always do them. They're going to take a look at it. Maybe yes, maybe no. The lender that does two loans they do owner-occupied second homes and non-owner-occupied, no problem. It fits into the guidelines as long as you qualify for it. We're going to talk a little more about that. And as long as there's enough funds to do everything you need to do. The one loan lender will do single family, condos, PUDs, townhomes, and manufactured homes. So you can buy a manufactured home potentially with the one loan lender. The two loan lender does single family condos, PUDs, townhouses, modular homes, but they will not do manufactured homes. So that's one of the differences between the two lenders. As you saw from the previous slide, the one loan lender will go 75% of a loan to value between both properties up to 1.5 million. They will do higher loan amounts, guys, but the combined loan to value there drops from 75% down to 70% or maybe even lower, depending on the situation. If you do the two loan, they do 75% uh, loan to value on a mortgage on the departing residence, as we saw, and they'll give you 80% loan on the purchase. So you can potentially get more money with that lender that does the two loans. So that's helpful for some people in some situations. The one lender that does the one loan does not do that loan in Hawaii. That's kind of a Western States loan with that particular lender. But the two loan lender does Hawaii along with almost all of the other states. There's a couple of states on the East Coast that they won't do it. So Hawaii is available there. Some other fairly important things here. The qualification for these loans is, is kind of interesting. If you do the one loan, they qualify you on the permanent loan after the required principal reduction is made. So even though you're going to have two loans, you're going to be making payments on if you do choose the one loan lender. Though you're going to have the loan on your departing residence, you need to continue to make payments on that. And you're going to have the larger loan that they use to purchase the new home, which has payments on it. As long as you can make those payments, you're good. And they're going to qualify you on the permanent loan after you've sold your home and you pay down the loan that you used to buy the new one. It's going to be a smaller loan at that time. That's the loan they qualify you on with the payment there. Whereas the one with the, term, the two loans, they qualify you on the permanent loan from the very beginning because remember they do two loans. The loan they do on the departing residence has the deferred interest at the 9.25%. We do not put that payment into your qualifying ratio because you're not making any payment there. Instead, you'll use the payment on the loan that you get 
to buy the new home in the debt ratio and you'll qualify on that payment. And you'll notice that the debt ratios qualifications are significantly different. So the lender that does one loan for everything, you have to qualify with a debt to income ratio of 43%. Now remember that's 43% of the permanent loan once the dust all settles and you've paid everything down, but it's still a relatively conservative debt to income ratio. As opposed to the lender that does two loans will let the debt ratio go up to 50%, significantly higher, which is one of the reasons why people use that loan over the first one, because they qualify for more loan and more home. And another very significant thing is the lender that does one loan, the departing residents must be in the same state as the property that you're buying. So they, you can't have a loan on a, a property in California and then buy a home and a property in Washington state. It just doesn't work for them. Both properties need to be in the same state. The lender that does two loans, they do Hawaii and other places. The properties can be in different states with them. So that borrower who lives in California wants to buy their residence in Hawaii, we can use this bridge loan concept for them and, and use the home, both homes in the two different states as collateral and still potentially make it work. Something you wanna be aware of with this loan because it can delay closing at the very end is that both of these loans have something called a three-day right of rescission that's in place because they're refinancing their current home. What that means is this, when you close on both of these loans, at escrow on the purchase of the new home, you're gonna put a mortgage in place, whether it's in second position with the one loan lender, or if it's just a loan all by itself with the lender that does two loans on their departing residence. That loan's gonna go into place at the same time that the loan's gonna go in place to purchase the new home. However, when you do a refinance, and that's what that is on the departing residence, you're refinancing the current mortgage that's there or putting the second mortgage in place. Federal guidelines require that we have what's called a three-day right of rescission on owner-occupied refinances. That applies here. That'll delay closing for three days after these loans are ready to fund. You have to wait three days and then you record and close then. So you wanna be aware of that for the purchase because it delays with those three days. Okay, so that's the typical bridge loan. So we've talked about in the past, we have the longer seminar on, webinar on, and you can get from us. But there is a third and different approach, which is relatively new. It really technically is a bridge loan, but you're gonna see that the approach is kind of unique and different. But first, I have to ask you another question. Why did the mortgage lender go out of business? Well, why would a mortgage lender go out of business? Lack of interest, of course. <laughs> okay, I promise that's the last bad mortgage joke in this whole webinar, okay? Let's take a look at the third and final approach to bridge loans here. The reason this loan works is because of uh, some criteria that Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac have. Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac are the entities you've probably heard of in the news. They're called secondary market lenders. They're quasi government controlled entities. They purchased the loan from banks, conventional loans in particular. So if you're a conventional borrower and you go to any bank around and get a conventional loan, the criteria that that lender is going to loan to came from Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac because eventually they're gonna purchase that loan from the lender, which recoups the funds back into that lender's vault so they can lend that funds, those funds out again to somebody else. So Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac have their guidelines on purchasing loans. And one of their guidelines says that if you have a valid offer on your departing residence and quote, any financing contingencies have been cleared with that offer, then we can remove the current homes, the departing residents mortgage payment, principal interest taxes and insurance from being included into debt ratio analysis for the buyer. Let me say that another way for you guys. If you have a valid purchase offer on your departing residence, a valid offer, and the financing contingencies have been removed. That means that the borrower has been approved with a lender typically, and all of contingencies are removed. They've looked at income, they've looked at credit and so on, and there's no financing contingencies, they're ready to close. You basically, you know, everything's ready to just close. Then Fannie Mae says, we don't have to include the, the mortgage payment on the departing residence in the debt ratio when you qualify for the new home. That removes that obstacle of having to qualify with both mortgages. Even though the mortgage is there, 
but you have an offer on it to purchase it and they can close at any time because the financing contingencies have been removed. That's why Fannie Mae will allow us to remove the mortgage payment from the debt to income ratio. So there's a very smart company that uses that little clause, both Freddie and Fannie have that available for another approach to this. So note, it's important to know this approach only works for purchases that use conventional financing. So if you're an FHA borrower or VA for the new home or reverse mortgage borrower, we do reverse mortgages for purchases as well. It does not work there because they don't have the same criteria. Fannie and Freddie do. Fannie and Freddie apply to conventional loans only. So if it's a conventional borrower, which the most, most are, then you can potentially do this approach. So this is how this works. We're going to call the company NCB, which stands for non-contingent buyer in this case. You're not going to, as the borrower, you're not going to deal directly with that company. You're going to deal directly with, excuse me, you're going to deal directly with your loan officer and your, re your real estate agent directly, and they're going to represent you. This is just another program we have available that helps you get into a home when you have this situation. So let's say the company NCB gives you a valid offer to purchase your departing resident. It's valid, it's signed by you and them, it's an offer. They only offer up to 70% of the fair market value of your home. Now compare that, remember, with the other two approaches, which will go 75% of the fair market value of your home. So one thing here is that they're a little more conservative in how much they will give you. The same company, NCB, they have the offer in your home, will also give you a second mortgage on your home for the difference between the purchase price, which is 70% of the market value, and the current mortgage. We're gonna do that math in just a second so you can see it with our scenario here. The second mortgage they give to you has zero payments and there's zero interest on that loan. Compare that with the other two loans. The first mortgage, which is cross collateralized is 7.25% if you remember. And the second mortgage is 9.25% while you're carrying the loan prior to having sold your, your home, your departing residence. This particular approach, the second mortgage has zero payments. So you don't need include it in your payments or your debt ratio and it has zero interest. There's no accruing interest on that loan while it sits there. The offer contains no financing contingency, so Fannie Mae will look at that and say, this works. That removes the mortgage payment from the debt to income ratio. You list your home to sell and you move forward with it. You have um, 120 days to sell your home. And there it is there. So if you sell your home within the 120 days, you pay NCB, the non-contingent buyer, the people who lent you the money, 2.4% of the sales price, plus there are some other miscellaneous fees which add up to about $1,000 that you pay. And I wanna note that other conditions apply. And really what that means is if you have a home which is worth less than 100,000, they won't even do the loan because it doesn't cost, it's not worth enough. If it's worth less than 350,000, then the fee could go up because it's a smaller priced home. But if you're over that value, then 2.4% plus some additional fees applies there. That's what it costs you to do this particular approach instead of the interest rate and the closing fees on the other loans that we talked about. Now, if you don't sell your home within 120 days, NCB is gonna complete the purchase of your home for 70% of the market. So they're gonna close. They're going to own your home. They give you 120 days to close it. They're gonna relist the home to sell because they now own it. They're gonna relist it at the market value. They're going to sell it as high as market value as they can. They're gonna make an honor, uh, honorable effort, good due diligent effort to do that. And when it sells, you're going to pay them 2.4% of the sales price, just like it's on your contract up front, plus any fees they may have incurred to sell your home, like the real estate agent fees and escrow and title, which you would have incurred anyway on your sale and all of the rest of the proceeds left over go to you on the sale. So it's really not so bad. It's pretty clever with the way they have going here. The funds from the second mortgage that you got when you closed on the mortgage with them, this is remember, they haven't bought your home yet. They just have an offer to buy it at 70% of the value, but they do give you the second mortgage when you need it and it closes on that the day that you need to close on the purchase of your new home. So to give you the second mortgage, you use that as the down payment on the home you're buying. 
You use a conventional loan for the purchase of the new home. So clearly one of the benefits of this approach is you get a lower interest rate with the conventional loan than you do with the rates from the, the bridge loans. They're simply higher. It's a, it's a higher cost of doing things. And some of our borrowers before, we've done bridge loans and they kind of look into it and they go, well, you know, I got all these closings, I got higher interest rates, I got to carry these mortgages. They decide not to do it. Some do it because it makes you a non-contingent buyer, buyer and they want to purchase a home. As long as you qualify for the purchase loan, you're good to close with this third and different approach here. So let's do the math here so you can see what it looks like. So remember, NCB will end up to 70% of the value of your current home. Well, the current home is worth 600,000. 70% of that gives you a loan amount of 420,000. However, they're gonna subtract out the $200,000 you owe, and you're really gonna end up with $220,000 uh, prior to closing costs. So we understand there's closing costs in all these ex examples, which we need to take into account in the real world. I'm simplifying it here. So if you have an $850,000 purchase on the new home that you're buying, you have $220,000 to put down on that home. You need 630,000. That's 74% of the purchase price of 850,000, which is very doable from a conventional perspective, as long as you qualify for that loan, a $630,000 loan, no mortgage insurance required. That could work and should work for many people. That's the math there. Three different approaches to purchasing a home non-contingent on the sale of your residence. And there you are, the happy couple going, woohoo, we were able to buy our new home, move up, put the kids in their new bigger bedrooms and do it non-contingent. People do this, guys, because they want to buy a home and contingent offers in this environment are not necessarily accepted by sellers. Certainly, if there's a buyer there with the same offer price and they're non-contingent, and you have an offer price and you're contingent, most sellers are gonna take the non-contingent offer and that's exactly what this does for you. It makes you a non-contingent buyer. There's my quest, my question. Uh, let me know if there's any questions. I wanna look at the chat box here. I'm gonna come back to the Teams meeting. There's the phone numbers you can reach me at, my cell number. There's the email address and all of that. Those of you watching on YouTube, certainly use those to reach out to us and we're happy to chat with you. Thanks guys, appreciate you being here with me. Bye-bye.